My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. I am an independent scholar from Belfast. I will be speaking to you this afternoon about the seaboard of the ancient steppe, Greek and Roman voyages in the Black Sea. The Eurasian steppe was a vast belt of arid grassland extending from Manchuria on the eastern edge of China into Mongolia and across Central Asia to the Black Sea. Most of the steppe was a landscape of thin, wiry grassland in an ecological zone subject to extreme seasonal climates. The people who occupied these territories were mounted nomads, tending large herds of grazing animals that they drove hundreds of miles between seasonal pastures. The steppe population were highly mobile, skilled warriors able to fight as mounted archers. Up to a quarter of their adult population were available to raid or fight. A marching infantry army could cover about 25 miles per day. A mounted steppe army could double the speed, and if each warrior brought spare mounts to ride and relay, then the horde could travel hundreds of miles in a few days and outpace any warning of their arrival. The largest steppe nation in the east was the Zunglu, the Huns, who occupied Mongolia and could mobilize more than 240,000 mounted archers. The western steppe narrowed and became more verdant as it approached eastern Europe, and some of the lush grasslands in these outlying territories could be seized and farmed by settled communities. During the time of the Greeks, the Pontic steppe, which enclosed the Black Sea, was occupied by a mounted culture known as the Scythians. By the Roman era, the Scythians had been absorbed and replaced by an eastern nation called the Sarmatians. Ancient accounts suggest that the Sarmatians could mobilize more than 190,000 mounted warriors. But a series of great rivers divided the Pontic Caspian steppe into distinct territories, and the Sarmatians were not united into a single regime until late antiquity, when a horde of displaced Huns conquered this entire region. Mediterranean civilization was shielded from steppe invasions by the forests of Eastern Europe, the Black Sea coastline, and the connecting Caucasus Mountains. These were barriers to land communication, but the Black Sea provided a thoroughfare for Mediterranean seafarers to visit and trade with the Pontic steppe. This was important because the steppe formed a distinct ecological zone that produced unique and essential products including animal hides and furs. The great rivers that flowed into the Black Sea had abundant stocks of fish, and the fertile seaboard offered excellent lands for grain production. Food production in this region was significant because maritime transport was a cheap and convenient way to move goods between distant territories. Figures from the ancient world suggest that marine transport was more than 20 times cheaper than land haulage. Using winds and tides, a 75-ton cargo vessel could transport the equivalent of 150 wagon loads without the cost and bulk of providing animal fodder on journeys that would take weeks to accomplish. Greek communities began to colonize the Black Sea coast in the 8th century BC. They established urbanized centers in grain-producing districts and exported foodstuffs that fostered the growth and development of Aegean city-states, such as Athens. The Black Sea is over 700 miles across at its widest point, and extends more than 160 miles from north to south. It covers an area almost the size of modern Spain, if inlets such as the Sea of Azov are included in the measurements. The Black Sea was about the fifth the size of the Roman Mediterranean, but most of the surrounding territories were relatively wild and underdeveloped due to their more northerly latitude. The upper coast extended north to the Eurasian steppe, and the western shores faced the mountainous forest-covered core of central Europe. Mediterranean ships entered the Black Sea through the Bosporus Passage, a narrow strait 17 miles long and less than 2 miles wide. In Greek myth, this was the location of the Cenaean rocks, which clashed together and crushed incoming vessels. Here Jason released a dove to trigger the mechanism in order to pass safely through. 
There is a concentrated saltwater strata far below the surface of the Black Sea. Light cannot penetrate these deep waters, and low oxygen levels prevent the growth of microbes that degrade organic materials. Consequently, ancient and medieval ships that have sunk to these depths have not decomposed, but become submerged in silt on a lifeless seabed. Recently discovered wrecks have the remains of rudders, masts, rigging and coils of rope. Decorative carvings are preserved, and in some instances chisel and tool marks are still visible on individual hull planks. Archaeologists and explorers are currently mapping the remains of these vessels, and the Black Sea therefore offers a unique opportunity to understand the maritime intercourse that connected and sustained the ancient world. The early Greeks estimated the size of the Black Sea, using information about the length of voyages between its outlying ports. Herodotus had heard that the voyage from the entrance of the Black Sea to Phasis, on the extreme east coast, was a sailing of nine days and eight nights. By contrast, a voyage to the northern limits of the sea in Crimea could be completed in three days and two nights. This suggests sailing speeds of about three knots nautical miles per hour, which is half the top speed of ships in the Mediterranean. The Romans knew the approximate size and shape of the Black Sea, which they understood to be a relatively flat southern shore facing an arc-shaped northern coast. Pliny explains that the Black Sea intrudes on a large area of the continent, with a coast formed from a great bend that curves back as though it were horns, and stretches out on either side to produce the shape of a Scythian bow. Two territories on the Black Sea coast had special significance to classical civilization, because of their resources and trade. These were the heavily forested territories of Colchis on the east coast, and the agriculturally rich Crimean Peninsula to the far north. Colchis was at the frontier of classical civilization, and its landscape was defined by myths and legends dating back to the time of Homer. The territory therefore had special significance in the classical mindset as a destination for dangerous voyages to the limits of the known world. The main seaport in Colchis was the ancient city called Phasis, founded by Ionian Greeks from Asia Minor in the 6th century BC. The forbidding snow-capped mountains in this edge of the world tree entered Greek myth as a place where the immortal titan Prometheus was chained by the god Zeus as a punishment for giving mankind the secret of fire. Born to a rock, it was said that a great eagle tore at his innards every day until he was freed from his agony by the intervention of the Greek hero Hercules. Ancient cultists was also immortalized in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, who sought the Golden Fleece in these same lands. In ancient times, Colchis was sparsely populated, and although it was rich in natural resources, it had few urban settlements. But the region was positioned along a sailing route that led to another important territory that was also subject to early Greek influence. This was the Crimean Peninsula, known in antiquity as the Chersonesos, or Taurus. The Crimea was settled by Greek colonists in the 6th century BC, and they became wealthy from farming its rich agricultural land. By the 5th century BC, their cities were under the authority of local Greek tyrants, who established dynastic rule over most of the region. At its widest extent, the Crimean Isthmus is almost 200 miles across, and stretches nearly a hundred miles from north to south. The landmass therefore covers an area larger than the Mediterranean island of Sicily. The Greek geographer Strabo was approximately correct when he estimated that Chersonesos was about the same size as the Greek Peloponnese. The southeast coast of the Crimea was flanked by a narrow range of steep rising mountains, but most of the interior of the isthmus consisted of steppe-like prairie land, ideal for growing grain. The mountains on the eastern seaboard 
shielded the isthmus from incoming cold weather, and the coast of the Crimea was warmed by black sea currents and mild winds from the south. Consequently, the Crimea enjoyed a temperate climate throughout much of the year, and its coast was well suited to receive foreign shipping, with many small peninsulas, headlands, inlets, bays, and natural harbours. The Crimea was an important producer of grain, and a leading centre for trade goods acquired from the adjoining Eurasian steppe. Strabo explains, Except mountainous district, extending to Theodosia, the land is everywhere flat, fertile, and extremely favourable for the production of grain. It yields a thirty-fold harvest when furrowed by any sort of a digging instrument. Strabo suggests that the Crimea could produce and ship up to 84,000 tonnes of grain per annum, which is enough to feed over 200,000 people for a year. The Azov Sea was heavily diluted by the incoming River Don, and therefore had plentiful stocks of fish. The Chersonensis also had salt works, and since salt was an important preservative in the ancient world, these fish stocks were exported to feed distant cities such as Athens. Strabo explains, In early times the Greeks imported their supplies of grain from the Chersonensis, and they imported their supplies of salt fish. During the 5th century BC, a succession of Greek dynasts, known as the Spartacids, gained control over the small cluster of Hellenic cities occupying the Crimean Peninsula and the neighbouring Asiatic coast. The Spartacids became wealthy by shipping large volumes of grain to Athens, at a time when the city ruled a powerful maritime empire surrounding the Aegean Sea. In gratitude, the people of Athens granted honorary Athenian citizenship to their royal allies in the Chersonensis. It was a 700-mile voyage from the Crimea to Athens, which represented a sailing of more than 10 days in optimum conditions. But the route was essential, and ancient sources confirm the skill of the Crimean grain trade that supplied Greek cities in the eastern Mediterranean. In 355 BC, the Athenian statesman Demosthenes explained, the Athenians have relied on imported grain more than any other nation. The grain we import from the Black Sea is equal to all the grain that comes to Athens from all other places. He confirms that Athens received over 16,000 tonnes of grain from the Chersonensis per annum, which would have been enough to feed about 30,000 people and suggests a merchant fleet of about 200 ships. In 340 BC, King Philip II of Macedon attacked the Greek merchant fleet leaving the Black Sea, and captured 230 vessels, including 180 ships owned and crewed by Athenians. The best account of Black Sea trade from the Roman era dates to the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. The account is provided by a Greek writer named Arian, who served as governor of Cappadocia in Asia Minor. In addition to his military career, Arian wrote a history of Alexander the Great and a ten-volume account of Trajan's war against the Parthian Empire, which has not survived into modern times. During his term as governor, Arian also composed a tactical report called Array Against the Alani, which described how the Roman army in the province of Cappadocia ought to be formed up for battle if a steppe people called the Alani breached the Caucasus mountains and invaded Roman territory. His work in the Black Sea is composed in the style of a Greek sailing guide known as a periplus, a circuit, which describes coastlines and sailing routes for mariners. Most of this document, known as the Periplus of the Black Sea, is based on direct experience or details gathered from Roman informants. In his report, Arian describes the entire circuit of the Black Sea, including places subject to Rome, 
regions ruled by allied regimes, and territories controlled by independent nations. He includes details about ports, landmarks, marine hazards, and sites that would have attracted foreign visitors. He also provides information about frontier administration, political arrangements, defence strategies, cultural practices and belief systems. Arian begins his Periplus of the Black Sea with an address to the Emperor Hadrian and starts a narrative from the Roman port of Trapezus on the southeast corner of the Black Sea. Trapezus was a prominent Greek city, but some of its civic amenities had fallen into disrepair due to neglect. The port was near the historical frontier of Colchis, and Arian reminds his reader that this was the coastline reached by the Athenian general Xenophon, when he had led 10,000 Greek mercenaries out of Persia in 401 BC. This was a place where the battle-weary and exhausted Greek soldiers cried out in thankful exclamation, The sea, the sea. <coughs> Trapezos was the main base for the Roman fleet on the Pontic shore, and Arian had selected a number of military craft for his voyage along the Colchic seaboard. These ships included lightweight Liburnian galleys, which had a single centrally placed mainsail and a bank of 60 oars, 30 oars on each side. In addition to the rowers, each of these ships could carry an onboard unit of between 30 and 60 infantry troops. The vessels could either be rowed by trained oarsmen or make way under sail when wind conditions were favourable. There were no cargo ships in the squadron assembled by Arian, but the Liburnians sailed with a large trireme galley, which operated as a command vessel. This trireme could have had up to 180 rowers, and it carried heavy military equipment, including cumbersome ballistic weaponry, but triremes had limited cargo space and were difficult to manage in adverse weather. It was customary for Greek and Roman travellers to perform carefully prescribed embarkation rituals before undertaking a risky sea voyage. Incense was offered to the gods at harbour altars to ensure divine assistance for a safe sailing, and Arian explains how at Trapezos he had repaired and enhanced some of the ceremonial features connected with these practices. Rough and weathered stone altars standing near the harbour had been replaced with white marble replicas, inscribed with the correct Attic Greek, in place of the corrupted script used by the local Hellenic community. A statue of the emperor had been erected at the harbour, but Arian informs Hadrian, though your statue has a pleasing pose, gesturing out to sea. The sculpture is not a good resemblance or particularly attractive. Arian reports that he had ordered another statue to be commissioned and sent to the port, so the monument might better convey the dignity of the emperor and the authority of Rome. Trapezus had a prominent temple devoted to the Greek god Hermes, the deity associated with trade and travel. His temple was reported to be in good condition, but Arian thought the existing Greek statue was not adequate, given the significance of the site, and requested that Hadrian send him a replacement image of the god at least five feet tall. He also asked for a smaller statue of the local god or divine hero, Philesios, that shared the temple. Philesios was said to be a descendant of Hermes, and travellers usually sacrificed to both deities before leaving on voyages around the Black Sea. Arian had an ox slaughtered to fulfil his obligations, and when the entrails were examined on the altar and showed no corruption, a perfumed libation was poured on them as an offering to the gods. Arian and his soldiers said prayers to the emperor, and then headed down to the harbour where the ships were awaiting their embarkation. On leaving Trapezos, the Roman squadron sailed east to a garrison post named Husuliman. It was less than a day's voyage away. 
Usuliman was near the mouth of the Karadeh River, where ancient remains have been discovered, including a rectangular fort with a gatehouse in each wall. At the fort, Aryan had the infantry soldiers perform military manoeuvres, with a display of javelin throwing to demonstrate their combat readiness. The garrison had a small cavalry contingent of 20 mounted troops, and this was considered sufficient for keeping order in the area. The squadron under Aryan's command left Husuliman in the early morning, taking advantage of the cold winds that blew down from the surrounding coasts. When the wind dropped, Arian ordered the oarsmen to row the vessels along the Pontic seaboard. Then, with little warning, dark clouds rose up from the horizon, and the squadron was caught by a sudden storm. As waves threatened to swamp the low-lying decks of the war galleys, the Romans stowed their sails and tried to row out of the turbulence. Arian reports that the squadron was saved when a violent offshore wind suppressed the waves and pushed the heavy surf back from the struggling vessels. He writes, Having suffered much, we arrived at Athenae. Athena was a small deserted settlement named after an ancient temple that was dedicated to the goddess Athena. It was also the site of an abandoned fort that the Roman authorities had decided not to garrison. The site had no harbour, but there was a relatively safe mooring place close to the shore that could accommodate a number of ships and offer shelter from the strong winds blowing along this coast from different quarters. However, that particular night, violent thunder and lightning woke the troops and signalled that another storm was approaching. As the wind rose, Arian realised that the mooring place was no longer safe, and by the light of torches and lamps, he ordered his men to immediately beach their ships upon the shore. Ropes and cables were used to haul the Liburnian vessels up onto the beach, but Arian ordered the trireme to take its chances afloat. The trireme was needed to haul the smaller galleys back into the water with tow cables, so its survival was essential. Out at sea, the crew threw down heavy anchors and cabled the vessel to an offshore rock to ride out the storm. But before the last Liburnian was dragged ashore, the full force of the storm hit, and Arian reports that the sea turned completely savage. Only one vessel was destroyed in the storm. It was Liburnian Vagali that had been caught broadside by a wave, and it had turned on its mooring to make the dash onto the beach. The vessel tumbled over and was smashed against the shoreline by the pounding waves. The crew escaped and swam ashore, but the galley was broken up on the beach. Two days later, the storm, when the storm had calmed, the Roman troops were able to salvage the wreck. Arian reports that everything was retrieved, including the sail, the rigging, the nails and even the sealing wax was stripped off the vessel. He adds that when the task was completed... None of the fittings remained except for the ship's timber, which, as you know, is an abundant resource in the Black Sea region. As the storm subsided, the ships were refloated and spent the following night at their mooring. Arian reports that. Towards morning, we struggled against the waves coming over the sides of our ships. But when the northerly wind arrived, the squadron were able to depart Athenae on a calm sea. From Athena, it was a 25-mile sailing east to a well-fortified city named Apsaros, Gonio in Georgia, at the mouth of the Kura River. <coughs> Apsaros was supposedly named after a legendary Colchic prince named Aspertes, who was killed at the site by the Greek hero Jason. It was said that when Jason seized the golden fleece from Colchis, he fled on board his ship, the Argo, with the sorceress princess Medea. In some stories, Aspertes led the Colchic fleet in pursuit of Jason and cornered him at this site. But when Aspertes agreed to parley with the Argonauts, he was murdered. In other legends, 
Aspartes was the infant son of King Aretes, who was abducted by his sister Medea, and dismembered by her as their father approached with the Colchic fleet. King Aretes was paralysed with grief when he saw the remains of his murdered son, and ended the pursuit at this sight. According to Arion, whichever version of the story visitors to the city chose to believe, they would all be shown the same ancient tomb of Aspertes. The port of Apsaros was the site of a large Roman garrison consisting of five cohorts, or about 2,500 troops. The city had a hippodrome for horse racing and a theatre which would have been of particular interest to Hadrian as he was an admirer of Greek theatrical culture. An inscription reveals that there was a community of veteran soldiers resident at Apsaros who had decided to remain in the city after receiving their discharge retirement bonuses. Pliny estimated that Apsaros was about 140 miles from the fleet base at Trapezus. Apsaros controlled an important east-west route from Armenia into Pontic Asia Minor. So the stone-built Roman fort at Apsaros was larger than other military outposts on this frontier. It occupied a rectangular area with a gatehouse in each wall flanked by adjacent towers. There were four, tor four corner towers on the fortress walls and a series of five square and three rounded towers positioned around the perimeter to maximize sight lines and firing positions. Arian informed Hadrian, I issued the army its pay and inspected their weapons. He also reviewed the walls and its trenches, the soldiers on sick leave, and the garrison food supplies. Arian included a full report on the condition of the defences and garrison at Apsaros. But this report was written in Latin and unfortunately has not survived. Three years later, in AD 135, an army of mounted Alani warriors breached the Caucasus Mountains and threatened to invade Asia Minor. In response, Arian made this fortress his command post and summoned the Cappadocian legions to repel the steppe invaders. Strabo suggests the voyage along the Colchic coast from this point onwards was a relatively easy sailing since the shores are soft and the coast has river outlets. The region was renowned for its shipbuilding resources, including large quantities of timber brought down on its rivers, sailcloth linen made by local peoples, supplies of hemp for rigging rope, and wax and pitch for waterproofing hulls. The Roman economy was dependent on seafaring, so these resources were important in maintaining maritime connections across the empire. The region had been brought under Roman authority by the eastern campaigns of Pompeii, in the first century BC. From Saros, Arian sailed with the Roman squadron north to the port of Phasis on the east coast of the Black Sea. Arian describes the strange properties of the Phasis River, the Rion, which flowed down through the Caucasus Mountains. The Phasis was the largest river in the region, and it discharged a vast quantity of unusual water into the Black Sea. This water was fresher and lighter than the contents of other rivers and had the appearance of being tainted by tin or lead. The outflow from the Phasis River did not mix easily with the surrounding seawater and was seen floating above the marine currents. Arian observed how local people would take their cattle down to the shore to drink because the river had greatly diluted the salinity of the adjacent sea. These odd properties encouraged a superstition amongst sailors, who would pour away all stored water when they reached the river and took on board fresh, fastest water. Arian reports that, It is said that those who do this will encounter favourable sailing conditions. To the Greeks, Colchis was a forbidding region, shut in by rocks, strongholds and rivers that run through ravines. Strabo describes Phasis as the furthest most voyage and reports that the great fame of this country in early times is revealed by the myths which refer 
in an obscure way to the expedition of Jason. Apollonius Rhodius imagined how the Argonauts stowed their sails and manned the oars to enter the broad flowing Phasis in search of the shady grove of Ares where the glaring serpent, a monster terrible to behold, watches over a golden fleece spread over an oak tree. Appian had a theory concerning the golden fleece of Greek legend, and he describes how many streams issuing from the Caucasus carry fine gold dust that is almost invisible. The mountain people placed sheepskins with shaggy fleeces into the stream to collect the floating particles. Appian suggests that these fleeces might have been the prize sought by Jason. The Phasis River is mentioned by ancient poets and orators as one of the prime points on the Roman frontiers alongside the Euphrates, Ethiopia and Britain. Within the Caucasus, there were five native rulers who sought recognition from Rome as regional kings. Their authority either extended over tribal settlements in the mountains or covered rural populations near the coast. Some of these rulers had received imperial confirmation and grants of power from the Roman Emperor Trajan, and Hadrian had approved at least four of these rulers as kings. The cooperation of these kings and their native communities was crucial to maintaining the security of coastal Greek cities. Near the gates of Phasis, port, there was a large statue of the patron goddess Vesene that personified the town. She was depicted holding a symbol and seated on a throne with lions at her feet. Arian thought that the statue resembled Rhea, the earth mother of the Greek Pythian. The main anchor from Jason's ship, the Argo, was on display in the town centre as a monument to the ancient myth. Arian wrote with frankness about this object and explained that it is made of iron and although it does not look old to me, the shape is unusual and is not the same size as modern anchors. There were also some old fragments of a stone anchor on display and Arian believed that these objects were more likely to be the remains of the anchor that Jason had aboard the Argo. Apollonius Rhodius confirms this tradition, that the Argo carried stone anchors. Strabo calls Phasis the Emporium, commercial centre of Colchis, and explains that the site had good natural defences, protected on one side by the river, on another by a lake, and in another by the sea. The town had a Roman fort garrisoned by a small and well-equipped force of 400 select troops. Arian describes the fort had a double-ditched perimeter and its original inner wall was made from banks of earth and a wooden palisade guarded by two flanking towers. The site was being upgraded by replacing the wooden defences with walls and towers made from brick blocks. Arian concluded, The new fortress is fully equipped to prevent any of the barbarians from approaching, and it will certainly protect the garrison from sieges. Arian had also given thought to the protection of the surrounding community, which included many merchants and ex-soldiers. He reports, the mooring place for the ships and the whole area outside the fort must also be secured because it is settled by veterans and various merchants. In assessing the situation, Arian ordered the perimeter for the town to be fortified by a double-ditch stockade that extended from the fort to the river and fully enclosed the harbour and surrounding houses. He concluded that the town would soon be highly secure and become a very convenient place, and a safe place for those who sail this route. Roman merchants operating at Phasis received Indian cottons, pearls and black pepper, which had been transported through the Caucasus mountain passes. These mountain passes connected through the Caspian to the Central Asian silk routes. North of Phasis, the Colchis seaboard curved west towards the Crimea and the upper reaches of the Black Sea. 
Ariel explains that the squadron were no longer sailing in the direction of the setting sun, as they followed a coastline overshadowed by the greater Caucasus. On this sailing, the summit of an enormous landmark named Strobios came into view, amongst the distant mountains, Mount Elbowuz. The snow-covered peak of this formidable summit was pointed out as a place where, according to legend, Prometheus was strung up on the orders of Zeus. Apol Apollonius Rhodius imagined what the crew of the Argo might have seen as they sailed, past the steep rising crags of the Caucasian mountains, where Prometheus had his limbs bound to hard rocks by the galling of bronze shackles. They might have heard a loud whir near the clouds as their sails shook with the fanning of hum huge wings, and seen long wing feathers like polished oars, and witnessed the scream of Prometheus as his liver was torn away. From Phasis, it was a voyage of 63 miles along this coast to the site of a fortified Hellenic city named Sebastopolis, Sukumai. Sebastopolis used to be known by the name Dioscorius, and the city had been founded by Milesian Greeks in the 6th century BC. Strabo characterised Sebastopolis as a cultic city, and the greatest emporium of the surrounding tribes, the meeting place for 70 populations. But by the Augustan era there was a large steppe presence near Sebastopolis, including many Sarmatians. Pliny had heard that during the late Republic, Roman traders carried out business in the city with a staff of 130 interpreters. However, he reports that in his own time the city had declined dramatically and much of the merchant community had abandoned the site for more profitable ports and markets on the Black Sea coast. Parts of the city might have been abandoned, but the fortress remained intact and well guarded. It was almost midday when Arian sailed into the port of Sebastopolis. The remains of stone towers and walls have been found in the seabed near Sukume, which were probably Roman defences submerged by coastal erosion, seismic activity or dramatic changes to the sea level along this coast. Arian calculated that it was about 226 miles from the fleet base at Trapezos to the city of Sebastopolis. This was not a great distance for Greek or Roman cargo ships involved in coastal trade circuits, and the sailing could be completed in four days if conditions were favourable. After visiting Apsaros, Phasis and Sebastopolis, many trade vessels would have followed the Black Sea coast north to the Crimean Peninsula, to conduct further commercial deals with ports adjoining the Scythian steppe. During the Roman era, the Crimean kingdom was subject to the empire and its Hellenic kings were approved by the emperors. The kingdom sent annual tribute payments to Rome, accompanied by ambassadors who sailed on specially designated vessels. Lucian took passage aboard one of these returning ships, as it sailed from Rome past the western coast of Greece near Corinth. When Arian undertook his voyage around the Black Sea, he sailed only as far as Sebastopolis on the frontier of direct Roman rule, because this was the limit of his provincial command. However, he thought it worthwhile to include information on the voyage to Crimea in his report. The client king Cotus II had just died, so there was a possibility that Hadrian might choose to depose the dynasty and place Chersonensis under direct provincial rule. Arian explains, I have decided that it is my duty to explain the sailing routes as far as the Chimaean Bosporus to you, so that if you are planning something for the region, you would know about the voyage. Sailing north from Sebastopolis, Greek ships passed along a coastline that had many well-known mooring places and natural harbours. This coast led to the Taman Peninsula, which enclosed the Sea of Azos. By the era, the Taman Peninsula was part of the Crimean Kingdom, and it was another important grain-producing territory, with a regional capital called Phanagoria that had Greek origins. The Kurok Strait between the Crimean 
and the Taman peninsulas, allowed passage into the enclosed Azov Sea. Passage through the strait was controlled by the Hellenic city of Panticopeum on the Crimean shore. Strabo refers to Panticopeum as the metropolis, capital of the Chersonensis, and Pliny describes it as the strongest city in the region. The city was built around an acropolis and had a harbour with docks for about 30 ships. Pliny estimated that the distance between Panticopeum and Phanagoria on the far side of the strait was barely four miles, and this is all the width that separates Asia from Europe. He reports that the sea was frozen solid in winter, allowing travellers to walk between the cities. Fishing continued during these months, when people cut into the ice with trident-shaped tools to retrieve large sturgeon. According to Strabo, the passage became an ice road in winter that could be crossed using wagons. A general sent by the Pontic king Mithridates IV to defend the Crimea was said to have won a naval victory on the strait during the summer and a cavalry engagement in the same place the following winter. The Sea of Azov was known to the Romans as Lake Moetis, and at its northern edge was the river Don, which led deep into the Russian steppe. Arian considered the river Don to be the dividing line between Europe and Asia, but its northern reaches had never been fully explored by any Greek or Roman travellers. Writing in the late 1st century AD, Pliny described the population living along the Don as Sarmatians, who had expelled the native Scythians from their territory. There was a Hellenic trading city called Tanaeus, where the river Don flowed into the Sea of Azov. Strabo reports that Tanaeus was second only to Panticapeum as the greatest emporium for Scythians and Sarmatians. Tanaeus was the most northerly and remote Greek outpost in the Black Sea, but its position offered unique trade opportunities. Merchants from Tanaeus dealt in mink and sable pelts, and Strabo reports that the nomads bring to Tanaeus their products, including slaves, animal hides to exchange for clothing, wine, and other things that belong to settled civilization. Pliny describes how the broad Crimean Peninsula was surrounded by sea, and its east coast consisted of low laeng, land rising to large mountain ridges. Its population was diverse, and included towns occupied by various native peoples, the descendants of Greek settlers and Scythian migrants from the steppe. Arian describes the sailing from Phanticopeum west around the Crimean Peninsula, which the Romans called Tarica. About 42 miles from Panticopeum, there was a former Hellenic city named Chimericon, which had declined until it was little more than a village. Approximately 28 miles west of Chimericon, travellers sailed past the Greek city of Theodosia, which had also become depopulated when commercial activities were redirected towards other ports. Strabo describes the region as everywhere productive of grain and containing villages and the old harbour at Theodosia could accommodate up to a hundred ships. These harbours might have remained in operation as places for ships to shelter from the violent storms from the north that affected this coast. Claudius Ptolemy records the presence of a military installation on the southern coast of the Crimea, known as Charax, the fortress. This site can be identified with a Roman fort which has been excavated on the top of A. Tordor Cape. The site, now known as Castrum Charax, was possibly established when the Emperor Nero temporarily, temporarily made the Chersonensis subject to full Roman authority and placed the kingdom under the control of the governor of Moesia on the west coast of the Black Sea. An inscription from Rome records how the governor of Moesia, Tiberius Plautus Silvanus, sent an expedition to the Crimea to defeat a force of Scythians threatening to invade the peninsula. The text records that he dislodged the king of the Scythians from the siege of Chersonensis and was the first to add a great quantity of wheat from that region to the grain supply of the Roman people. 
Castrum Charax was strategically important, since it controlled sailing routes around the peninsula and occupied land near the shortest crossing point between the Pontus and the Crimea. In the 2nd century BC AD, the fort received garrisons from legions based near the Danube frontier. The remains at Castrum Charax include defences built using lime mortar, Roman brick bath houses with clay heating pipes, a cult building, and altars with dedications to Jupiter and other Italian deities. The inscriptions include mention of military road builders, who were probably tasked with improving routes to the main Crimean cities from the coast at Castrum Charax. These roads were probably planned for rapid military development, deployment, but would have facilitated transport and trade. <coughs> Just beyond the southern tip of the Crimean Peninsula, archaeological work has uncovered the remains of city walls, defensive watchtowers, a Greek temple, a Roman amphitheatre, and ancient farmlands under civic authority. Here there was a thriving Hellenic city named Chersonensis that had its origins in a Greek colony established in the 6th century BC. Pliny reports that the city was encircled by five miles of wall, and its inhabitants preserved a culture that was considered the most Greek of all the cities in the region. Ships voyaging onward left the Crimean Peninsula and began sailing along the northwest shore of the Black Sea towards the Nyperbug estuary. This narrow estuary led 40 miles inland and received water from two major river systems. A Greek city called Albia lay close to the river Bug, which led inland to the forests of Central Europe. Strabo describes Albia as a great trading centre. About four miles west of Albia, the Hellenic city of Odessos had good mooring for ships. Rising in Russia, the Dnieper flowed over a thousand miles down through the Ukrainian steppe to the Black Sea coast. The Bug, Dnieper and Don all formed important north-south migration routes for steppe people to move cattle and products between seasonal grazing lands. Some 30 miles west of Odessos was the mouth of the Nestor Est River and the site of former Greek settlements known as Iconion and Tyras. Rising in Europe, the Nestor flowed through the Carpathian Mountains and formed the northern frontier of Dacia. Goods from across these regions would reach Odessos, including valuable amber from territories near the Baltic Sea. The Roman orator, Dio Chrysostom, visited the Greek community of Odessos, Boristhenes, sometime between AD 96 and AD 101. He describes it as an important trading centre, with a sheltered, marshy estuary with slow-moving river outlets. Consequently, ships could run aground in the summer months, when the water level fell to 12 feet in part of the inlet. Dio warns that this coast has a muddy shore overgrown with reeds and trees, with many trees visible in the midst of the marsh resembling the masts of ships. Pilots had to be alert, as sometimes those approaching, who are less familiar with these inlets, have lost their way, supposing that they are approaching other ships. There were a large number of salt works close to the Nyper Bug estuary, from which most of the people buy their salt, as do the Greeks and the Scythians. Dio reports that after the Sarmatians seized this coastline, they established a fortified outpost near the estuary known as the Citadel of Elector. Western steppe nations allowed women to acquire military commands, and when Dio Chrysostom visited the region, the citadel belonged to the wife of a Sarmatian king. Events in this region indicate the effect that prolonged steppe invasions could have on classical cities founded on commerce. The Greek cities in this region were in terminal decline, 
and Dio describes the diminishing classical culture and reduced capacities for overseas organisation. This is a model for how classical civilization eventually faded away. Greek communities in this part of the Black Sea had lost their autonomy when the Sarmatians overran the Pontic steppe in the mid-first century BC. Diochrysism records that after the takeover, some of the Greeks no longer wanted to form cities, while others had a wretched existence as their communities were joined by numerous barbarians. Many Greek ships stopped sailing to the Nipperbog estuary because the Sarmatians had no people of common speech to receive the merchants and had neither the ambition nor the knowledge to equip a trading centre in their own in the Greek manner. The new steppe rulers of Odessos managed to restore commercial traffic by permitting the Greeks to form a distinct community to manage civic regulations and social networks favourable to visiting merchants. Nevertheless, Diochrysism thought that Odessus was in decline since the city did not match its historic reputation. This was due to its repeated seizure in wars and the fact that the city had been in the midst of virtually the most warlike barbarians for a long time and constantly in a state of conflict. By AD 96, many civic buildings in Odessa were in disrepair, and the city had contracted to a small defensive area in one fortified stretch of its former circuit wall. Dyer reports that, few towers remain on the wall, and the current defences do not match the original size or power of the city. The replacement walls were low and largely assembled from dismantled building materials. A new defensive facade was therefore established and the intervening spaces between houses were blocked to create a wall-like barrier around an exposed part of the site. Diochrysism describes how ancient ruined towers on the outskirts of the reduced settlement remained as an indication of the city's former limits. When Dio visited the city, the Greek community, he saw temples, shrines and public buildings. But he records, not a single statue remains undamaged in the sanctuaries and all have suffered mutilation along with the funeral monuments. Numerous Greek and Roman cities in the Danube and Balkan regions suffered a similar fate during the 4th and 5th centuries AD when the Huns united the western steppe and launched decisive attacks on the late Roman Empire. One particular practice demonstrates the strength of belief and superstition amongst Greek and Roman mariners. Arian reports that there was a strange white-coloured island in the sea near the Nipperbug estuary that was sacred to the Greek hero Achilles. It was said that his mother, the nymph Thetis, gave the island to her son for exercise and training. And for this reason, the place was known as the Island of Achilles or the racetrack. The island was well known to Greek and Roman writers from this period, and Pliny had heard that Achilles might be entombed on the island. Arian confirms that the Isle of Achilles was believed to be a place of wonder with a supernatural influence that extended into the surrounding sea. The island was uninhabited, except for a temple with an ancient wooden statue of Achilles. Sailors visiting the island often captured a wild goat to sacrifice at this temple. It was said that the divine presence signalled its satisfaction by rendering the goat unresistant to the blade. A great deal of wealth had therefore accumulated within the temple because landing parties kept offering goods until the animal ceased its struggles. People made pilgrimages to the island, but any ships that made unscheduled stops due to incoming storms used items from their cargoes. Arian reports that all manner of votive offerings decorated the unguarded temple, including ceramic bowls, jewellery rings and expensive precious stones. 
Visitors to the site had carved inscriptions on the temple walls in Greek and Latin to honour Achilles and thank him for divine assistance. These inscriptions also honoured the legendary Greek hero Patrocles, a close comrade of Achilles in the Trojan War. There were a large number of wild birds in the isle, including cormorants and gulls. Arion had heard that they flapped seawater from their feathers onto the temple paving stones every morning and cleaned the surfaces with their wings. Achilles was said to appear in dreams and the crew aboard nearby ships had night visions giving them instructions about the best place to land. Sometimes Achilles appeared to sailors who witnessed an image of the hero on the sail or prow of their ships. Although Arion considered himself to be a practical man, he was unwilling to dismiss these stories. He had spoken to people who had landed on the island and concludes, these things do not seem incredible to me because I believe that Achilles was a divine hero and inferior to no one. The Black Sea coast continued south towards the marshy delta of the Danube River, which formed a major frontier of the Roman Empire. South of the Danube River, Boeotia and neighbouring Thrace were lined with city ports, including Thomas, where the port Ovid was banished by the Emperor Augustus. Arian ends his account of the Black Sea at Byzantium, on the European side of the Bosporus Strait. This city was destined to become the new capital of classical civilization in late antiquity. And from this port, Greek and Roman ships carrying valuable Black Sea cargoes could once again enter the Aegean Sea and connect with a wider Mediterranean economy. Thank you for your attention.